Hello and welcome to photosynthesis. Okay, so photosynthesis at its heart is an energy transfer process. And as you have seen at the beginning of chapter 12, the process of photosynthesis transfers light energy into chemical potential energy of organic molecules. Uh, this energy can be then released for work and respiration. And almost all the energy transferred to all the ATP molecules in all living organisms is derived from light energy used in photosynthesis by autotrophs. Um, such photoautotrophs include green plants, the photosynthetic prokaryotes, and both single-celled and uh, multi-celled protocysts. So those would be like green, red, and brown algae. A few autotrophs do not depend on light energy, um, but instead use chemical energy sources. And they're called chemoautotrophs, um, which include like nitrifying bacteria, uh, which we know are super important in the nitrogen cycle. And nitrifying bacteria obtain their energy from oxidizing ammonia uh, to nitrite, or nitrite to, to nitrate. So photosynthesis is the trapping or the fixation of carbon dioxide and its subsequent reduction to a carbohydrate. Um, and that's using hydrogen that's been separated from water. And it takes place inside chloroplasts. Okay, nearly all life on Earth depends on it. Uh, light energy turns into chemical potential energy, which becomes available to consumers as well as decomposers. Um, and in the process, this releases oxygen so that aerobes like us um, can depend on it for respiration. So there are two sets of reactions uh, that are involved in photosynthesis. There's light-dependent reactions for which light energy is, is necessary, as well as light-independent reactions for which light energy is not needed. Okay, so here are um, the overall equations for photosynthesis. So here's the photosynthesis um, in a green plant, which again is the light-dependent light energy. Okay. So just to talk about the light-dependent stage first, uh, this takes place in the thycoloid membranes of the chloroplast. Okay, photosystems are embedded in the membranes, okay, in these thycoloid membranes. And um, photosystem one mainly happens in the integral lamellae, and photosystem two almost exclusively on the Grinnell uh, lamellae. And photosystems, what they do in general is they trap light energy, um, which can then be converted into chemical energy. And we're going to go into a lot of detail about that. Okay, so um, light dependent reactions only take place in the presence of suitable pigments um, and suitable light that can absorb certain wavelengths of light. Okay, so light energy is necessary for the splitting of photolysis of water into hydrogen, which we saw is necessary to do photosynthesis as well as oxygen. Um, but oxygen is a waste uh, product in this process. So light energy is also needed to provide chemical energy in the form of ATP for the reduction of the carbon dioxide to the carbohydrate uh, in the, in the light, in, uh, light independent reactions. The photosynthetic pigments that are involved fall into two categories, and that would be a primary pigment and an accessory pigment. The pigments themselves are arranged in light harvesting clusters called photosystems, okay? um, of which there are two types, one and two. In a photosystem, several hundred accessory pigment molecules surround a primary pigment molecule, and the energy of the light absorbed by the different pigments is passed to the primary pigment. Okay, so the primary pigments are two forms of chlorophyll, and they're said to act as reaction centers. And you can see that in this model, there are accessory pigments that are lining um, this whole uh, uh, area, and then they're funneling that light energy into the primary pigment reaction center. And so these photosystems are lined within the thycoloid membrane, and they're really um, an essential first part of the light-dependent reactions. So the light-dependent reactions include the splitting of water, like we talked about, by photolysis to give the hydrogen ions that are needed, um, and as well as the synthesis of ATP into photophosphorylation. Uh, the hydrogen ions combine with a carrier molecule, NADP, which you've um, seen before, to make reduced NADP. Uh, ATP and reduced NADP are passed from the light-dependent to the light-independent reactions. 
and photophosphorylation of ADP to ATP can be cyclic or non-cyclic, and we'll look at those in a second, uh, depending on the pattern of electron flow in one or both types of photosystems. Okay, so let's take a look at cyclic photophosphorylation. So cyclic photophosphorylation involves only photosystem one. Okay, this is light that is absorbed by photosystem one and passed to that primary pigment. Uh, an electron in the chlorophyll molecule um, is excited to a higher energy level and then is emitted from the chlorophyll molecule. And this is called photoactivation. So instead of falling back into the photosystem and losing its energy as thermal energy or fluorescence, the excited electron is then captured by an electron acceptor and passed back to a chlorophyll molecule via a chain of electron carriers. So cyclic photophosphorylation. So this is also part of the light dependent uh, reaction. So during this process, enough energy is released to synthesize ATP from ADB and an inorganic phosphate group by the process of chemi <laughs> chemiosmosis. The ATP then passes to the light independent reactions. Okay, so this brings us to non-cyclic photophosphorylation. This involves both photosystems in the so-called Z scheme of electron flow. Um, this is where light is absorbed by both photosystems and excited electrons are emitted from the primary pigments of both reaction centers. These electrons are absorbed by electron acceptors and pass along chains of electron carriers, leaving the photosystems positively charged. The primary pigment of photosystem one absorbs electrons from photosystem two. Its primary pigment receives replacement electrons from the splitting of water. As in cyclic photophosphorylation, ATP is synthesized as the electrons lose energy while passing along the carrier chain. Okay, so this Z scheme is something you need to be able to draw. Let's watch a video of non-cyclic photophosphorylation.
Okay, photolysis of water. So photosystem two includes a water splitting enzyme that catalyzes the breakdown of water. The oxygen is a waste product of this process. The hydrogen ions combine with electrons from photosystem one and the carrier molecule NADP to give reduced NADP. Reduced NADP passes to the light independent reactions and is used in the synthesis of carbohydrate. The photolysis of water can be demonstrated by the Hill reaction. The Hill reaction um, is a redox reaction. And its redox reactions are oxidation reduction reactions and involve the transfer of electrons from an electron donor, okay, which will be the reducing agent, to an electron acceptor, which is the oxidizing agent. Sometimes hydrogen atoms are transferred so that dehydrogenation is equivalent to oxidation, which we've seen uh, in the process of respiration. So the Hill reaction, uh, in 1939, Robert Hill showed that isolated chloroplasts had a reducing power um, and liberated oxygen from water in the presence of an oxidizing agent. So the reducing power was demonstrated by using a redox agent that changed color um, upon being reduction, reducted. Reduced. <laughs> this technique can be used to investigate the effect of light intensity or of light wavelength on the rate of photosynthesis of a suspension of chloroplasts. So here's a graph that you need to familiarize yourself with. So the, the rate of loss of blue color, which you can see there on the y-axis, okay, um, can be used to investigate um, light intensity or light um, wavelengths. Okay, so the rate of loss of blue color as measured in a, um, matching tubes against known concentrations is a measure of the effect of the factor being investigated. So you could be investigating light intensity or wavelength of light. Um, and it's, in, it's investigating um, the effect on chloroplast activity, okay? Chloroplasts were extracted from lettuce and placed in buffer solution with DCPIP. The coral, corolometer reading is proportional to the amount of DCPIP um, remaining unreduced. Okay, so now we can start on light independent reactions. The fixation of carbon dioxide is a light independent process in which carbon dioxide combines with a five carbon sugar to give two molecules of a three carbon compound, okay? Also called, um, it's either uh, glycerate three phosphate or sometimes it's called PGA. And this cycle is otherwise known as the Calvin cycle. Okay, so GP in the presence of ATP uh, and reduced NADP from the light independent stages is reduced to that triose phosphate. Okay, so that's the three carbon sugar. This is the point at which carbohydrate is produced in photosynthesis. Okay, most would like about five, six of the triose phosphates are used to regenerate uh, RUBP, but the remaining one sixth are used to produce other molecules needed by the plant. Some of these triose phosphates condense to become hexose phosphate, which in turn are used to produce starch for storage, sucrose for translocation around the plant, or cellulose for making cell walls. Others will be converted to glycerol and fatty acids to produce lipids for cellular membranes or to acetyl coenzyme A for use in respiration or in the production of amino acids for protein synthesis. Okay, in eukaryotic organisms, the photosynthetic organelle is the chloroplast. chloroplast. Um, in dicots, chloroplasts can be seen with a light microscope and appear as biconvex discs. Convex discs. Um, and there may be only a few chloroplasts in a cell, or as many as 100 in some palisade mesophyll cells. So the structure of a chloroplast is surrounded by an envelope of two phospholipid membranes. And we know that this is a system of membranes which also runs through the ground substance or the stroma of the plant. Um, it's the site for the light-dependent reactions of photosynthesis. It consists of a series of flattened fluid-filled sacs or thycoloids, which in places form stacks called grana that are joined to one another by membranes. The membranes of the grana provide a large surface area, which holds the pigments, enzymes, and electron carriers needed for the light-dependent reaction. Um, and again, this is that form and function, right, that we see that stacks of any structure like this are really just increasing um, the amount of space uh, that can be used inside the cell, okay? 
So the membranes make it possible for a large number of pigment molecules to be arranged so that they can absorb as much light as necessary. The pigment molecules are also arranged in particular light harvesting clusters for efficient light absorption. In each photosystem, which you see here on the right, the different pigments are arranged in the thycoloid in funnel-like structures. And that makes it so that each pigment can pass its energy to the next member of the cluster by feeding it into the chlorophyll uh, reaction center, which is that primary pigment down there at the bottom. The membranes of the grana hold the ATP synthase and are the site of ATP synthesis by chemio chemiosmosis. The stroma is the site of the light-independent reactions and contains the enzymes of the Calvin cycle, sugars, and organic acids. It bathes the membranes of the grana so it can receive the products of the light-dependent reactions. Um, also within the stroma are ribosomes, uh, 70S ribosomes, a loop of DNA, lipid droplets, and starch grains. The loop of DNA codes for some of the chloroplast proteins, um, as well as um, the ones which are made by the chloroplast ribosomes. However, other chloroplast proteins are coded for by the DNA in the plant cell nucleus. Okay, so the main external factors affecting the rate of photosynthesis are going to be light intensity and wavelength, temperature, and carbon dioxide concentration. So at constant temperature, the rate of photosynthesis varies with the light intensity. Um, it will initially increase as the light intensity increases, but at higher light intensities, this relationship no longer holds, and the rate of photosynthesis will reach a plateau. Okay, similarly, the effect on the rate of photosynthesis of varying the temperature at constant light intensities can be seen. So at high light intensity, the rate of photosynthesis increases as the temperature is increased over a limited range. At low light intensity, increasing the temperature has very little effect on the rate of photosynthesis. So those two experiments illustrate two important points. One, we know that photochemical reactions are not generally affected by temperature. However, these experience, uh, experiments clearly show that temperature affects the rate of photosynthesis, so there must be two sets of reactions in the full process of photosynthesis. These are the light-dependent photochemical stage and then the light-independent temperature-dependent stage. These experiments illustrate the concept of limiting factors. Okay. The rate of any process which depends on a series of reactions is limited by the slowest reaction in the series, and you guys learned about this in STEM. Okay, in biochemistry, if a process is affected by more than one factor, the rate will be limited by the factor which is nearest the low value. So at low concentrations of carbon dioxide, the supply of carbon dioxide is the limiting factor. Okay, at high concentrations of carbon dioxide, other factors are rate limiting, like light intensity or temperature. So if you look at this figure, okay, at low light intensities, the limiting factor governing the rate of photosynthesis is the light intensity. As the intensity increases, so does the rate. But at high light intensity, one or more other factors must be limiting, such as temperature or carbon dioxide. So in the light independent stage of photosynthesis, you may remember that carbon dioxide combines with RuBp to form a six carbon compound which then immediately splits to form two three-carbon molecules. Plants that do this are called C3 plants. But there are plants like maize and sorghum um, and most other tropical grasses that do something different. Okay, the first compound that is produced in the light-independent reaction contains four carbon atoms. They are therefore called C4 plants. Okay, so avoiding photorespiration. So why would tropical plants need to do something different from other plants in the light independent stage of photosynthesis? The reason is a problem with the enzyme Rubisco. So this enzyme catalyzes the reaction of carbon dioxide with RUBP. But unfortunately, it can also catalyze a reaction of oxygen with RUBP. But when this happens, less photosynthesis takes place, right? Because some of it is being diverted to that um, reaction with oxygen. Okay, so um, RUBP is being wasted and is less available to combine with carbon dioxide. So this unwanted reaction is called photorespiration, and it happens most readily in high temperatures in high light intensity. So conditions that are found at low altitudes in tropical parts of the world. Okay, I know this um, image is in German, uh, but I really liked the cycle that it shows. So, I, so here's another similar one that's in English. Okay. Tropical grasses like maize, sorghum, and sugar 
have evolved a method of avoiding photorespiration. So they keep the RUBP and the rubisco well away from high oxygen concentrations. The cells that contain RUBP and rubisco are arranged around the vascular bundles and are called bundle sheath cells. They have no direct contact with the air inside the leaf. Carbon dioxide is absorbed by another group of cells, the mesophyll cells, which are in contact with air. So the mesophyll cells contain an enzyme called PEP carbo carbolase, which catalyzes the combination of carbon dioxide from the air with the three carbon substance called PEP. So the compound formed from this reaction is o oxaloacetate. Still inside the mesophyll cells, it is now converted to malate and is then passed on to the bundle sheath cells. So now the carbon dioxide is removed from the malate molecules and delivered to the RUBP by rubisco in the normal way. Okay, the light independent reaction then proceeds as usual from there. Enzymes in C4 plants generally have higher optimum temperatures than those in C3 plants, which makes sense considering their geographic locations. This is an adaptation to growing in hot climates. So for example, in one study, it was found that in amaranth, which is a C4 plant, the optimum temperature for the activity of PEP is around 45 degrees Celsius. If the temperature drops to 15 degrees Celsius, the enzyme loses around 70% of its activity. By contrast, the same enzyme in peas, which are C3 plants, have found to have an op optimum temperature around 30 degrees Celsius and could continue to work at much lower temperatures, but not much higher. Okay. So here is um, the tissue surrounding a vascular bundle of a C4 leaf. You can see that ring of mesophyll cells there. So this tight ring of specialized mesophyll cells excludes the air from the cells inside the ring. Okay, the cytoplasm fixes carbon dioxide. The chloroplasts capture that light and carry out the light dependent reactions, but not the Calvin cycle. Okay, and then you can see there the bundle sheath cells. The bundle sheath cells carry out the Calvin cycle, but not the light dependent reactions. So no air will get to those cells and they get carbon dioxide from those mesophyll cells. Okay, chloroplasts contain several different pigments um, as we saw in lab the other day. And these different pigments absorb different wavelengths of light. So the photosynthetic pigments of higher plants form two groups, the chlorophylls, which are the primary pigments and the carotenoids, which are the accessory pigments. Okay, and we saw these, these um, chlorophylls, the chlorophyll A and B, which was the yellow green or the blue green uh, that we saw in that spinach extract in lab, and the carotenoids, okay, which was the orange and yellow pigment. Okay, so here's the structure of chlorophyll A. You do not need to learn this molecular structure. It's just for you to understand uh, what it looks like. Okay, you can see there the head and the tail. So chlorophyll absorb mainly in the red and blue violet regions of the light spectrum. They reflect green light, which is why plants look green. Uh, the structure of chlorophyll A is shown here. The carotenoids absorb mainly in the blue violet region of the spectrum. Okay, so this is an absorption spectrum. It's a graph that um, shows the absorbance of different wavelengths um, of light by a pigment. Okay, so an action, action spectrum is a graph of the rate of photosynthesis at different wavelengths of light. Um, and this shows the effectiveness of different wavelengths, which is of course related to their absorption and to their energy content. The shorter the wavelength, the greater the energy it contains. So if you illuminate a solution of chlorophyll, A or B, with ultraviolet light, you will see a red fluorescence, okay? And in the absence of safe ultraviolet light, you can illuminate the pigment with a standard fluorescent tube. The ultraviolet light is absorbed and the electrons are excited. But in a solution that only contains extracted pigment, the absorbed energy cannot usefully be passed on to do work for photosynthesis, right? So the electrons return to their unexcited state and the absorbed energy is transferred to the surroundings as thermal energy. Um, and as light is at a longer and less energetic wavelength than uh, at which it's absorbed and is seen in the red fluorescence. Okay. So in the functioning of photosynthetic system, it is this energy that drives the process of photosynthesis. Okay. So you can easily extract chloroplast pigments from a leaf to see how many pigments are present by using paper chromatography. Um, and we did this in lab.
uh, the other day. And so, you know, these will vary depending on the solvent used, but in general, carotenoids have an RF value that, are, that is close to one, and chlorophyll B has a much lower RF value, uh, and chlorophyll A has an RF between the carotenoids and the chlorophyll B. All right, so that is it for photosynthesis. We will see you in class.